it would have known that it was okay to like rest or to do these things that seem like they're not necessarily helping your performance. Like I really work on self-care with athletes I work on. Like how can you, what can you focus on after practice to just like give your body and mind a break? And it doesn't always have to be like a huge breath work session or meditation. Maybe it's like really connecting with your friends or like treating yourself to, I don't know, your favorite takeout at night yeah. and like watching your favorite show. Like that can be restorative as well. Welcome to the Elevate Podcast. I am your host and coach, Tyler Johnson. Thank you for tuning in. And whether you've tuned in to elevate your mindset, your game, or just your day, you are in the right place. My guest this episode is a former student athlete herself, swimming at Cal Berkeley, later becoming a competitive open water swimmer as well. She now teaches mindfulness to athletes as a coach and as a speaker. She also has a book club with another former past Elevate guest, Dr. Di Grant. Welcome to the Elevate Podcast, Mika Shaw. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I am well. Um, I know you're joining us from, is it sunny California? I know it's been rainy out there. Yeah, <laughs> it is um, it's sunny again. It's Good. always. I'm from Alaska, so it's always interesting the freakouts, uh, cold weather freakouts in Southern California. Sure, sure. <laughs> well, you had to start. Um, I know you're a former competitive swimmer, open water, and we're a swimmer growing up, but can you kind of, for our listeners, take us through a little bit of your athletic journey and then kind of what led you from your athlete uh, days into the work you do now with athletes? Yeah. Um, so I kind of grew up all over the place, but swimming was the sport that I stuck with. So I used to, I when I was younger, I was really into diving and that was kind of the thing I wanted to excel at. But when we moved up to Alaska, they didn't have diving and um, I stuck with swimming and I just kind of didn't really try anything else. I just really liked it. Um, so I swam through high school and then I moved down to Southern California and I competed at Golden West College, which is a community college. Then I transferred to Berkeley. Um, and I guess college is where my, I always say like where my mental skills journey began because I like the step up to Berkeley was such a huge competitive jump. And sure. I just experienced a lot of um, imposter syndrome and like my nerves just seemed to be really out of control. And I just knew I was getting in my own way, but I didn't really know what to do about it. And there wasn't a lot of resources or help where I didn't feel like I could talk to anybody <laughs> about yeah. my experience. So I just kind of like held it in and felt like I could have been better. Um, fortunately, I had the opportunity to compete in open water swimming a couple years after so I graduated retired and then got back into swimming about two years okay. later started competing in open water swimming and that was kind of I really valued the mental side during that time as much as the physical so I worked with a mental skills coach I started work reading any book I could on sports psychology and practicing whatever I could I really um just dove, dove yeah. right into it. Um, and I improved a lot, um, but I didn't really, I was so focused on like mental skills for performance. I didn't really acknowledge that I'm a whole person and you have to deal with all of the emotions sure. that you experience in your day-to-day -day life. Um, yeah. So when I retired from open water swimming, I was a little heartbroken from my experience and it took me a, a really long time to process it. And through that process, I started going to therapy. I also became a mother after I retired. Um, so my focus was completely different and was introduced to mindfulness through um, a yoga training that I did. And that was just sort of like this light bulb click, clicked for me. Um, like why, why didn't I know this yeah. when I was swimming? And I wish I would have known that practice when I was competing. Um, so it really fueled me to start working with athletes, um, teaching mindfulness, meditation, like simple breathwork practices um, to help 
an athlete navigate their experience, not only on the performance side to like be that best athlete they can, but also to be able to like acknowledge their whole person, I guess. And just really like to be able to transition out of sport um, more skillfully. So that's that's where I am now. (laughs) (laughs) Got plenty of questions on mindfulness and some yoga and things like that. But when as very much a, a land athlete in my days, um and I was a swimmer as a young a little kid but uh open water swimming just induces a whole different set of fears and anxieties and uh things that a lot of times in other sports aren't environmental concerns going around you um was that something that you had to kind of transition to to just being you know in not the safety of a pool um and being in environments where maybe there's more variable of factors yeah, it's, that's an interesting question. I think now I'm more fearful of being in the ocean than when I was swimming. I was introduced to um, open water racing when I was in college. I lifeguarded at Hunting, in Huntington Beach during the summer. So okay. I started doing lifeguard competitions and I just loved the ocean. I've always had like a very active imagination. And in the beginning, it was a positive. Like when I started open water, I was like, I'm going to be a mermaid. I can be in the ocean all the time. And I loved it. Um, and I think just when you have that competitive mindset, like you're going in for a race, I never really worried about, you know, people are always like, are you scared of sharks or (laughs) like how deep the water is? I never really thought about it. Um, I think it's definitely an interesting to look back because the, it's kind of like a sensory deprivation when you're in the ocean, like the only, you can only hear the water in your ears. You can't talk to someone you can't talk to the competitors next to you you it it felt really isolating um and that was interesting to navigate especially when I tried some of the longer distance the 10k is the Olympic event so that was the race that I did all the time which is definitely long it takes about two hours but um I did two 25ks um and that both both of them I think I was like around six hours or a little over six hours and that was definitely a mental um, a level that I wasn't prepared for because it was just so, I was so trapped inside my head. Then my body started to fatigue to a point that I'd never experienced before. And it just felt really um, overwhelming. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you talked about finding mindfulness. Um, you also, you know, teach yoga, Pilates, meditation, um, when you kind of go back, which order did you find those and which order, and maybe not which order, but, uh, order which you found them. And then which do you wish you knew about earlier as an athlete? Yeah. So I started taking my Pilates certification while I was still swimming. I took I did not make the 08 Olympics. I took a little bit of a break and I enrolled in the Pilates certification. And then I started swimming again. So took a bit a break from the Pilates certification and then retired. And it took me a really long time to finish my Pilates certification. Um, I don't teach yoga or Pilates now. Um, I think they're both amazing for athletes. I think the, the mental side of Pilates, a lot of people think like, I don't have preconceived notions about it. I think it's an amazing um supplement to an athlete's program if they can fit it in because if the body awareness that it teaches you and also like the mental skill of concentration and really focusing on like these tiny movements and how your body is moving through space rather than when you're in your sport you're not thinking of in such like yeah tiny view um and I think the same for yoga I think like slowing down and learning to like slow down your breath and that you don't always have to like push and grind you can actually like slow down and take your time and that can help you in your performance as well um both of those led me on my path to discovering mindfulness but that's the one to me that's really has stuck and that I practice consistently just because I think um that awareness piece yeah. for me was really um enlightening and the enlightening is not the right word, but uh, was very illuminating. Um, and uh, 
Yeah, it's just the one that I think you can you can apply to training in your sport specifically. I think yoga and Pilates, it can be really overwhelming to say, oh, now I'm going to add like an hour of Pilates to my week or an hour of, pol- of yoga. Mm-hmm. If you're a student athlete, like your schedule is completely packed. If you're a professional athlete, your, your, your schedule is packed too. So it can be really hard to add that much time to your schedule. I think it, I learned about yoga and then meditation, kind of post-athletic career as well. Um, but y- you said something there that kind of caught my attention about like listening to your body. And I think that was one of the things as an athlete, it was always telling your body, go, 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 do, 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 harder, 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 right? Versus this ever really slowing down to kind of listen and learn about our, yeah. our, our connectedness. What are some key things that when we do slow down that you know, mindfulness can help us when it actually comes to regarding to our performance. Yeah, I think, I don't know if your athletic experience was similar, but when I was in college and even swimming professionally, the messaging that I got was always to keep pushing, like to not listen to your body, to not listen to your emotions or how you felt, but just to like kind of put that all aside and like grind and push. And I think, um, there is a time and place for that. Like sometimes it's needed if you train your whole life for the Olympics and you sure. wake up the day of okay. Olympic trials and you don't feel great. Like you need to like, just <laughs> do right. what you can that day. Yeah. Um, but I think for like sustainability and for your mental well being to be able to, it's like a very fine line. I think to be able to say like, this is not serving me today. Like I really need to step back and take a rest, but that means tomorrow I can give more of an effort. And I don't think I definitely wasn't taught that. So I just always pushed harder and felt like if I just worked harder, everything would work out where that wasn't the case. (laughs) And if I would have known that it was okay to like rest or to do these things that seem like they're not necessarily helping your performance. Like I really work on self-care with athletes I work on, like How can you, what can you focus on after practice to just like give your body and mind a break? And it doesn't always have to be like a huge breath work session or meditation. Maybe it's like really connecting with your friends or like treating yourself to, I don't know, your favorite takeout at night and like watching your favorite show. Like that can be restorative as well. Definitely. There's a lot of power and little rewards, right? Yeah. I love that. I always say like, I love the saying, I definitely did not coin it. I heard it somewhere and like held on to it, but like slow down to speed up. And I think of that a lot. Like you don't always have to be pushing and grinding. You can slow down, but that doesn't mean that you're not going to like give a great effort tomorrow or maybe the day after, but it's kind of keeping that bigger picture in mind. Yeah. And I like how you talked about the pushing, Uh, did have similar experience athletically. (laughs) And I think, you know, that was, I struggled with even, kind of post athletics, that was the mentality I took to work. And it's like, you can't outwork, out swim, out run everything in a real job. <laughs> you yeah. <know? laughs> um, you ha- there's some other mental agilities involved, but um, a lot of times kids we, and athletes and coaches too, or there's this mentality that mental toughness is about this endurance, pushing through, being able to overcome despite, um, but really a lot of times there is this big piece that is a little bit more mindful and it's letting go sometimes the result or or whatever it might be. It's not always just pushing and holding on to. Sometimes it is being able to let go. Um, That allows us forward on that path, maybe to get that result. But how do you see that, you know, dichotomy, I guess, of, yeah, as athlete, we have, we have these times we have to push through and, and be determined to to make the time or make the set or make the little goal of practice. But we also need, most importantly, also to have that ability to detach ourselves and maybe let go from a disappointing performance or disappointing day. Yeah, I think that's so important. I'm I'm very interested in mental toughness and self compassion and how the two play. Yeah. Uh, together because I think it's a really important duo and I think when I think mental toughness is kind of the messaging the I this idea of like always pushing and grinding was the messaging that I heard no one ever pointed out to me like 
the way I <laughs> treated myself wasn't very nice and how if I would have been able to be more kind to myself to let go of mistakes and perceive failures that I would have been able to get over those mistakes faster and be able to show up the next day or for the next competition with like more energy and focus for that race. Um, and I think, yeah, it's a, it's an unfortunate, oh, I, I'm losing my train of thought. I think mental toughness is def definitely really important, but being able to step back and like give yourself a moment to work through it and acknowledge the mistakes that you made, but also what you did really well. Like I, I never did that. I never acknowledged what I did well. I only acknowledged what I, what I thought were my failures. And then I kind of held on to those as I went along and it just became too uh, heavy a burden to bear. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there's a, I had a, one of my early guests on this podcast has, he went through green beret and Navy seal trading and, had done endurance, you know, he completed a race that David Goggins couldn't dropped out of. And when I asked him what mental toughness was, I was expecting this very bravado Navy, you know, kind of categorical answer. And he was like, you know, it's, it's really how much you love yourself. And, oh, wow. I it, love and, that. and he was just kind of like, you know, I've done all those things I just stated that are a lot of times associated with this mental toughness. He's like, but then I could get on Facebook and someone's comment would turn me into a tizzy. And I realize I'm not very mentally tough. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like if I'm mentally tough, if that bothers me, even though I can run a bajillion miles. Right. Um, and so that, that always kind of, that shocked me into kind of that same thing of, you know, compassion does definitely play a role in, in yeah. being mentally tough. And I think, as you push as an athlete, we lose sight of sometimes that self or that identity becomes sport. Um, how do you help athletes? Because that was something I struggled with post-career, um, not allowing sport or sport alone to become their identity. Yeah, that's, um, that's a really challenging one because I think when you're in it, it's super hard to like have that view that one day you're going to move on to something else. And you also... Like to be so dedicated and disciplined, you need that focus on like what you're doing. Um, I try to, I have some athletes that I'm working with that I feel like have a pretty good perspective on that. They have interests outside of sport and I try to encourage that. Um, I have some others that I, I worry about, like what, you know, like for them when they retire or move on, you know, what is it going to, what is that experience going to be like for them? Yeah. And I try to focus with them as well on the little things over the weekend, like checking, you know, asking them like, oh, are you doing something with your friends? Like, what are you asking them questions that are not related to their performance or sport? Um, I'm a big, I love values, like working with athletes on core values. Yeah. Um, I used to think I was like a big goals person, but now I'm like, I just, that doesn't really resonate with me as much. I think you need the dream. You have to know where you want to go. Yeah. But I think core values can be so helpful because more often than not your core values as an athlete, you can transition them to life after sport. Um, and that was something I struggled with all of the mental skills training that I did while I was swimming. I didn't really know how to transition that yeah. <laughs> to life outside of sport um, where I think mindfulness and like learning your core values, like those are really great practices to start exploring as an athlete. And then when you're finished, you can also see like, oh, this is the same in the workplace. Like I'm getting distracted. I'm going to refocus my mind. Um, or like, this is important to me. So it's going to help me make this decision moving forward. Um, and I just try to check in with those things from time to time to yeah. not always be about the performance. I love that you brought up the core core values. Uh, I always teach kind of one of things is you know, those core values are our beliefs that we have that can kind of serve us. I use that analogy of really like a bow and arrow where your beliefs are your bow. You're going to carry your bow with you. Your targets yeah. are going to change, you know, and you can choose your energy as your arrow that you're going to send towards those targets. And those things can change. You can find more arrows on your path, but you know, your bow is your bow. And, you know, I like, same thing kind of like the old Odysseus story like only you can string your bow right so yeah only you can can really dictate what your core beliefs are but um I think it's also challenging 
reflecting on, I wish I would have focused more on that as a student athlete. Um, but also as you work on it with them, how do you allow them to realize that um, they're not super rigid? Like what you believe right now might, you know, there's some core things that probably won't change about us, but there are beliefs that will change things that yeah. can impact us as we evolved as human beings and experience different things. Um, where do you see that balance when you're kind of identifying core values with, you know, allowing maybe some room for expansion when it yeah. is in alignment with our growth and maybe in alignment with the things that are going to serve us? Yeah, I try to, uh, one of my core values is curiosity. So I just feel I lean into that hard in my own life. And I try to like offer that perspective when I work with athletes. So um, I introduce core values with also the explanation that this isn't something that is super rigid. Like you're going to always have these same core values. They're going to grow with, with you over time. And maybe you outgrow some of them and pick up something else. Mm -hmm. And my values definitely changed when I became a mom, when I became, when I got married, like my whole focus changed. Um, and just, I really try to cultivate that sense of curiosity, not only towards our athletic experience, but just in general, like how we perceive things. And I think if you can hold on to a little bit of curiosity, there's that openness that comes yeah. with it, that you can sort of learn and go and you don't have to be super rigid. And like, this is the only way that I can accomplish this. Um, it gives you options yeah. and choices. Some, I wanted to talk more about some meditation and mindfulness. So on the okay. curiosity of transition, so maybe listeners that are coaches or kids that are curious about trying meditation, um, how do they do it? How do they, how do they make sure they're doing it the right way? <laughs> yeah. Um, there's different types of meditation and I teach mindfulness, so I can't speak to all of the different ways sure. that you could yeah. practice meditation. Yeah. I think with mindfulness, um, things that I constantly, barriers that I constantly run into is people uh, may be hesitant that mindfulness it has some type of religious undertones that they have to believe a certain something to practice. So I always mention that like what I teach is secular and it is based on the Buddhist teachings, but you don't have to believe anything to practice. Right. So we're just practicing being present in a non-judgmental way. Um and you might not always feel the way you want to feel because we're trying to accept the present moment for what it is. So you might not like sometimes I think when people think like, oh, I should feel relaxed when I meditate, um, being relaxed and stopping your thoughts, I think, and religion are like the three top like barriers. I think that people kind of stops people from wanting to practice is that they think, well, I can't meditate because um, my mind is going all the time and I can't stop my thoughts. And that's actually not what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to stop your thoughts. You're just supposed right. to notice them and then shift your attention away from them and focus on something in the present moment, like your breath or your body or sounds. Um, I always recommend starting ridiculously small and simple. So I usually start off introducing just deep breathing with an athlete, like just doing one minute of deep breathing a day. So yeah. it helps you find the time of day where you can start a consistent practice. Mm -hmm. It's one minute. So it's like, everybody has a minute. There's not really the excuse of like, Oh, I can't, I don't really have time for that. Right. You can find a minute. Um, and it sets the foundation for adding like to, from shifting from breath work to meditation. So I think once you have the awareness of how your body's breathing, and you can use your breath as a present moment anchor and you can um you have that awareness to actually notice your body breathing where a lot of people just aren't even aware right. that they're breathing even though we're doing it obviously all day every day right. what are you know most people when we talk about mindfulness or you know the breath what are some other mindfulness practices or, or little tools that we can integrate throughout the day i know there's this little book someone gave me that had a bunch of them one time and I would go through them and, and one of them that was the hardest for me was uh, being cognizant of every time you went through a door throughout the day. <laughs> and it was, and it talked about how, yeah, just, you just walk through doors and fling through doors. And um, 
I had this thought come back to me at my gym recently at the steam room, the door was slightly broken and everyone would walk in and the door wouldn't fully shut. And this guy would keep getting up and shutting the steam room door. <laughs> uh, you know, but I was like, I was like, Oh my gosh, no one's mindful about the door behind them. They just walk into the room. Um, yeah. But I struggled with that one so much. And it was just one of those like little things. What are some things maybe or little tools or practices that can help us be a little bit more mindful as we need maybe transition space, like a door provides us or things to help us just be more aware uh, of yeah. how we move throughout the day. That's a funny, uh, that's interesting that you say that. So when I first started meditating, I think I was doing like Headspace, the app or something. And one of the instructions was to notice yourself sitting down. Like the next time you sit down in a chair, like notice yourself sitting down in a chair and I never, I've never, I don't think I've said like I mean, what, eight, 10 years later, eight years later, like, I don't know if I've noticed myself sitting down on a chair um, and, and walking through a door seems like a hard one because you're doing it so often and you're walking. Yeah. You're obviously walking through, you're not, your destination is not necessarily the door. I think um, I recommend brushing your teeth. I think that's a really good, good place to start because it's short. You're also hopefully doing it every day <laughs> maybe twice a day three times a day um but you can have put like a little sticky note by your mirror yeah. like brush your teeth mindfully or whatever this is your mindfulness practice um but it's also a really short practice so it's not something like I tried washing the dishes once but as a mom I do a lot of dishes and it was just like constantly yeah. going back and then kind of thinking oh I wasn't mindful that time I better be mindful next time um so I think it's kind of finding what works for you I think brushing your teeth has been one that's like it seems like it's short enough but it's something you do consistently and you can also have like a little reminder by your toothbrush that it's um that it's easier to practice maybe um I also really love uh like be where your feet are so just at any point like noticing your feet on the floor your body, like the breath moving in and out of your body and just taking that like one second, two seconds pause. Yeah. Um, I am someone that's in my head a lot. I have a very active imagination. I have a lot of thoughts going on all the time. So mindfulness is not easy for me. <laughs> it's, right. I really work at it. Um, but I think having those tiny little practices throughout the day that kind of stop you in your thought process or where you are. And it's like, Oh yeah, my, like, I'm actually, I'm in my bedroom right now. I'm like in a calm, quiet space, but in my head, it might feel a little turbulent and it just gets me out of that space and back into reality basically. Yeah. yeah. I like, it made me think too, cause you, I, I literally had, written down those myths that you debunked already uh, <laughs> about that I want to do so you already hit on those but I think another one that sometimes comes up when you talk to some athletes about starting this meditation or mindfulness practice as they kind of explore it is that they need to like shift their whole lifestyle <laughs> to to become a meditator <laughs> yeah. or, so to speak versus like you said I mean it's finding the one minute brushing your teeth or that one minute of breathing um, it might change your lifestyle, but it's really more about finding the tools and times that can help you. Um, can you talk a little bit about the importance of, um, you talked about the ones that work for you, but the exploration, because I think we all kind of tinker with times and, and what works for us, um, maybe mindfully, but um, just the importance of being to explore those different tools and tactics and times throughout the day. Yeah, I think consistency is what comes to mind like consistency is obviously like very important physical training it is with like the mental side as well um for me when I started training or practicing meditation consistently I started to notice how it showed up in my daily life and that was when it really started to transform my life and it's not like I became a different person or all of a sudden did not have a million thoughts running around in my head but I just had these like little moments of space and quiet that felt like really groundbreaking to me um and as I've like explored I've, I've kind of used myself as a guinea pig I haven't been as athletic as I as I would like to have been the last couple of years over the pandemic but just like coming back to being an athlete like I think 
being <laughs> being able to have those like little breaks can be so helpful. I totally got ahead of myself in my mind as I was talking. <laughs> I apologize. I was not good. sticking to that question. Um, consistent, just the, the part of, like when you practice consistently, even if it's a little bit, even if it's just one minute a day or you brush your teeth mindfully or as you walk into practice, you're like, this is my, you know, these 10 steps from the car into the building, I'm going to just be fully present like you start to notice how that shifts your perspective on things. Um, and that's what I think can be so helpful. And I think once you start to notice how it plays out in your life, it helps motivate your practice at home. But so it can seem kind of daunting at first, like this isn't working, like my mind's all over the place. Like it just seems like a waste of time. Um, and then for me, I started having these little like aha moments where I was like, oh, wow, like that's really interesting and it made me want to practice more and learn more and sort of take that shift sure. but I do think that perspective like a lot of people think like oh I'm not um I'm not going to go live on a mountaintop and <laughs> meditate you know give up all my worldly belongings and meditate right, right. every day like that's not um for some people that is the path that they want to take but that doesn't yeah. mean that you are not a meditator or you can't be a meditator if you still want to live your life fully in the right. western world <laughs> sure. so i think uh especially you know, working with student athletes one of the things the western world gets us uh really good at is uh judgment mm -hmm. and as we kind of get into some of these practices you know i think we we learn about ourselves um but how, how can we kind of create space with that self-judgment so that we can just become more of a observer um, instead of always having the tendency to jump in with judgment, like yeah. our outside environments can often do. <laughs> yeah. But it's hard, I think, as athletes, too, because we are literally being judged. <laughs> all, all the time. <laughs> I mean, for some sports, you are getting a score. Um, I mean, I just felt like I always had coaches telling me, like, what I was doing wrong, what I needed to do better. It was just, like, constantly. So I judged myself um, very harshly. I actually did not notice how mean I was to myself until in to well into my thirties when I started meditating. And then that kind of came, that was one of the big things that came up for me. It was like, Oh, I'm so mean to myself. And I have like such high expectations that I very rarely reach. And then I just annihilate myself for them. Um, I think every time we meditate, we're working that practicing that non-judgmental aspect. So your mind wanders, you notice it wanders, you choose to come back to the present moment. And then maybe you also notice along that little journey that you're judging yourself for being a good meditator or not, or that you sometimes when I first started, like I was really judgy on my breath. Like I felt like I should be breathing deeper naturally or, you know, whatever yeah. it is it would. And then it's just kind of noticing those things. They come up a lot and in your practice, that's something that you can wear, like notice, like, oh, wow, that is really interesting that I'm judging my breath. That seems like such a silly thing to judge or, you know, just noticing it. And then you can also, when you choose to sort of let that thought be and come back to your breath, you're also practicing letting go of that judgment where maybe it doesn't feel like you're doing that in the moment. But even if just for a moment you focus on your breath again, you detach from that thought. And you you let it be, you've taken away its power. Um, so that comes back to that consistency too. It's like when you practice consistently in the small moments, um, then in the bigger moments, you have a little bit of that muscle memory built up that you notice like, oh wait, I'm really judging myself for that last performance, but I have another one coming right up. So I need to let it go. Um, I let it be, maybe I'll come back to it later and kind of take the learning lesson from it. And I need to focus on the task at hand, which is your sport and your performance. As we wrap up one more question, I wanted to ask for those, you know, coaches or athletes listening that want to, you know, integrate maybe some few minutes of a mindfulness practice into their sports practice later today or tomorrow. Um, what's something simple a coach might be able to do at the beginning or the end of practice just to, uh, or both to uh, <clears throat> dial in their athletes a little bit and have them a little bit more mindful before they go to practice. Yeah. I mean, I think 
starting or ending practice with a couple of deep breaths and maybe incorporating it into warm up. So like slowing down the warm up, letting athletes like kind of get into their body, get into like the mental space without feeling like super rushed. Um, the same can be said for like cool down. Um, I think, and I only say this from like a curiosity standpoint, because I never really had this as an athlete myself, but just kind of creating that curiosity towards like training, like valuing your athlete's perspective on things, like actually listening to them, yeah. which could be a whole other conversation. For sure. um, and um, like as a coach, you can practice mindfulness by actively listening <laughs> to your athletes and just like being fully present for what they're saying and really listening to whatever they need to share with you. Um, and then I think as an athlete, you can practice mindfulness in practice by like really getting in your body, like just noticing what does it feel like when you're warming up, like just kind of slowing down one tiny aspect of your training. Like I know you can't train like that the entire time. You'll right. be probably in trouble for being too slow and not paying attention to your coach's instruction. But even if it's just like one moment in practice, just one thing you do consistently, just sort of slowing down the process and really like getting into your senses. Like how do these feel in your body? Like, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? Like just using all of your senses um, in a short little moment and then moving on and doing things as you normally do. Mm-hmm.